Good afternoon, distinguished guests, colleagues. It's my great honour and pleasure to welcome Professor Lord Stern of Brentford to the European University Institute today to address us on the subject of his latest book. And the lecture is entitled, A World Economy in Profound Structural Change, The Logic, Urgency and Promise of Tackling Climate Change. We're delighted to co-host this afternoon's event with the British Institute of Florence, and I would very much like to thank uh, its director, Julia Race, for her collaboration in its organization. Time does not permit me to give you a comprehensive overview of Lord Stern's distinguished career. It would, with far too much ease, become a eulogy. What shines through in Lord Stern's curriculum is a combination of three things. Firstly, uh, a scholar, a scholar of academic distinction who's worked in some of the world's great universities, most notably now associated with the LSE, as an academic economist working on economics and government, but also a commitment to international organisation and global governance, his role in the EBRD, and as chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. And then also as advisor, firstly, hold a number of different roles in UK government, in the Treasury, and also as an advisor to Her Majesty's government. Lord Stern is someone who is committed to making a difference. He straggles the boundary between the academy and the world of public policy, and is committed to addressing the big issues of our time. I first heard of his name, as I think many of us in this room, uh, for his work as head of the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, published in 2006. The Stern Report made our distinguished guest a household name, not just in the United Kingdom, but throughout the world. Uh, Lord Stern was knighted for his services to economics in 2004 and made a cross-bench peer, life peer as Baron Stern of Brentford in 2007. The subject matter of Lord Stern's lecture this afternoon could not be more timely or urgent. Climate change fits all of the characteristics of a wicked problem in public policy. In fact, I would argue that it is the wicked problem to beat all wicked problems in public policy. Its consequences are local, continental, global. Addressing it requires us as individuals to change, it requires our societies to change, it requires change in our cities, in our homes and in our countries. Uh, there's also inevitably extraordinary contestation about how to address this, the possible solutions, their costs and the appropriate policy mix. Inevitably, with this level of change, there are distri distributive consequences uh, and those matter to all of us. And then, governing the transition that we now face is the greatest governance challenge, I would argue, that has ever faced humankind. And we will find out over the next period whether we can meet that challenge and that test. I'm delighted also that following uh, Lord Stern's address, my colleague, Professor Xavier Labanderia, director of the uh, SFR Climate Unit, will act as discussant. So Lord Stern, we're absolutely delighted to have you. We look forward very much to your lecture, and again, I, we're, you're very welcome to the European University Institute. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bridget, and thank you to the European University Institute for having me, and to the uh, British Institute in Florence. Thank you, Julia, also for your part in, in this event. Um, thanks also to the uh, UK Embassy. We have the Ken Oflati, the Deputy uh, Ambassador to Italy here. And uh, yesterday I was involved in the British School at Rome and uh, they played a big part also. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, I've given lectures before at the European University Institute here, but I'm struggling to remember when it was. And, um, in my memory, sort of, as you mentioned, things, I think it was before Stern Review. Um, but I do want to say it's a pleasure to be back and a pleasure to be here. Now, there is a slide pack which is long, and I'm going to go through less than half of it. Um, but I wanted to have the whole slide pack uh, because I hope that uh, 
it will be put on the website here and anyone who wants to look at it well these things are there to be used and recycled so I hope uh, anybody wants to can, can and perhaps it'll go up on the embassy website uh, as well um, but uh, well wherever anybody wants it um, I'm going to talk in large measure about my book which is uh, I can see at least two copies on the table here at the uh, at the front which is uh, why are we waiting it was originally the Lionel Robbins lectures at the LSC uh, so it's very deliberately an academic book in a way that the uh, Stern Review was something which I hope was academic but also directed to a much broader audience I hope this one why are we waiting is directed to a broader audience too but um, it is unapolog unapologetically uh, academic at some bits because after all it was the Lionel Robbins lectures at the London School of um, Economics um, I have worked for international institutions and I worked uh, briefly for three and a half years for Her Majesty's government in the, uh, in the UK. So I should say very clearly and strongly, I do not represent any um, institution or government in what I say. I'm also president of the British Academy and deputy chair of the trustees of the British Museum. So I am not committing any of the institutions which I'm now associated with or have been associated with, particularly the British government, to anything that uh, I have to say. You have before you an academic at the LSE who is going to tell you how he has tried to understand what is a very difficult but absolutely fascinating problem. So um, let me start with a big picture story and then I'll dive down into that big picture in various ways. The first part of that story is that sustainable growth and climate responsibility are inextricably intertwined. An alleged horse race between growth on the one hand and climate responsibility on the other is artificial. And that's absolutely fundamental. The transition and, uh, uh, is one which is a growth story, the transition to low carbon economy. And I'll develop, I'll develop that. The second point is that that transition to the low-carbon economy is full of attraction. It's not only uh, a sustainable growth story. As you look into what's involved in that story, it is uh, a change in the way we do things, which not only involves increased standard of living across its various dimensions, it is something that should be very attractive in terms of the way our cities would be, our communities would be much more efficient and clean ways of going about um, our life. So it's not only a possible story, it's an attractive story. So I'll try to make that case too. The third part of what I want to say, and something that's weighed with me ever more heavily in the last years, is the urgency. We're essentially at a special moment in, in time. The concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are already at a level which is going to make holding two to two degrees centigrade very difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. The later you leave it, the higher the concentrations when you get serious about it, and we could easily miss that moment. And two degrees is not some artificial number that might have been three degrees. It's there for a reason, and I'll, I'll, uh, come, I'll come back to that. We're a special moment in time, not only because of where concentrations are, but also in the way in which the world economy is changing. We're going through quite extraordinary change in the world economy. When I began lecturing in, uh, on development economics, which has been my thing all, all my life, it, economics, development and growth, public policy, um, in the early 1970s, we used to say that uh, this very small fraction of the world's population in the rich countries, uh, maybe 15 or 20 percent of the people, has got 80% of the income. That's not true anymore. It's, it's much uh, closer to a half now, and 25 years from now, it'll be one third. All for the excellent reason that many parts of the world have grown faster than the rich countries, and that's something that we should celebrate, and it's been associated with very important poverty reduction. But within that, we're seeing fantastically fast movement to cities. And uh, we've got three and a half billion people in cities now, 50% of a bit over seven billion people in the world. 
we will have 70% of the world's population in cities in all likelihood by the middle of this century, and the population will be a bit over 9 billion people. That's something like 6.5 billion people. So we will move in the next 35 years or so from 3.5 billion people in cities to 6.5. After that, it will probably slow off because as you go beyond 70%, that starts to slow down, and we know, at least we've got strong reason for thinking, the population increase will slow down too. This is a change um, which happens only once in human economic and social history, three and a half billion to six and a half billion. And the consequences of designing your cities as they are lasts a very long time. You know, I was born and brought up in London and there are a lot of Roman roads. Um, I've worked much of my life in India, South Delhi, was laid out by Lutchens a hundred years ago, and North Delhi, uh, mostly in Mughal times, a few or several hundred years ago. It's the same structure, and it probably will stay that way. So how we build and design and run our cities is of fundamental importance and will be determined largely over the next two or three decades. So the next two or three decades determines whether we've got any chance of holding to two degrees, and it also determine what sort of cities we have. And of course, those two are very closely intertwined. It's actually a privilege to be alive. I mean, I'm, it'd be great to be young now and to be, or even younger, I should say, uh, even younger now and to be able to uh, stay with that change. But it's a huge responsibility. We mess this up, as we might, um, this next 20 years or so. The consequences will be deep and uh, difficult and long-lasting. That's the urgency story. And lastly, I'll say something about Paris. I think we will get an agreement in Paris. It will not at first pass be an agreement consistent with two degrees centigrade. So the test for Paris is how seriously do we as a world commit ourselves to ramping up ambition? It will be an agreement. It will be a whole lot better than not having an agreement. But the question, the test is about acceleration beyond Paris and how far is that credibly within the picture um, discussions and agreements around Paris. So that's basically what I'm going to say. That's sort of the five minute version. So, but I want to dig down into different bits of it. Occasionally, I'll move into economics, which is quite technical although it won't look that way, but there will be quite difficult technical stuff underneath it, but I won't sort of um, push too hard. But those of you who want to look in a bit more detail, I hope you'll have a look at, uh, at the book. So uh, it'll be less than half of the slides, so you're going to see some of them flashing past you, but then I'll stop and, uh, and um, talk about some of them. But let me move to the... Uh, really my starting point, which I've already illustrated. This is a story about economic development and climate responsibility. It's a story about overcoming poverty and managing climate change. If we fail on one, we fail on the other. The, if we fail to manage climate change, we create an environment so hostile that hundreds of millions, perhaps billions, will have to move. Um, their living standards will be uh, um, severely undermined or destroyed and there would be extended conflict if that number of people had to move. That's a measure of the stakes we're playing, playing for. Clearly, that's inconsistent with overcoming poverty. The other way around, if we, in this next two or three decades, which I've argued are so important, if we put perceived barriers, or indeed actual barriers, in the way of overcoming poverty, we will not get the uh, commitment and collaboration that we need to manage climate change. So if we fail on the one, we fail on the other. But as I've argued, it's not simply failure and failure coming together. The success story, if we make it happen, looks extremely uh, attractive. So that's much of what I'm going to say. I'll say something very quickly about the science because it's the foundation of so much that follows. And uh, Bridget, as you'd expect, absolutely on the button, the science has, combined, has conspired to make this as difficult as it could be and uh, 
I'll explain uh, why. But let me just um, remind of the history. Joseph Fourier, the great French mathematical physicist, uh, about 200 years ago did a heat balance equation for the Earth, uh, energy flowing in, energy flowing out, and he discovered that the Earth was actually quite a bit warmer than his heat balance suggested would be the equilibrium temperature. Uh, so he concluded correctly that something was stopping the uh, energy from escaping because he was doing energy in and energy out, ended up, as far as he was concerned, too warm for his calculations. Something was stopping the energy going out. The Irish uh, um, um, scientist um, John Tyndall, by the middle of the century, same century, the 19th century, worked out which were the greenhouse gases that were doing it experimentally by seeing which of them did trap the heat. Um, at the end of that century, the Swedish chemist, uh, Arrhenius, did some back-of-the-envelope calculations. Well, how big could this effect be? What if we increased the greenhouse gases? How much might global average surface temperature go up? And he did quite well, actually, on, on the back of his uh, envelope. By the middle of the last century, or before the middle of the last century, and uh, quantum mechanics uh, was developing, they worked out what was going on. And what's going on is that the greenhouse gases oscillate at a frequency which in interferes with the infrared that uh, is trying to escape from the Earth's surface. Solar energy comes in, hits the Earth's surface, converted to infrared, and these greenhouse gases oscillate in a way that interferes. That's what defines a greenhouse gas. That's how you tell a gas which is a greenhouse gas from one which isn't a greenhouse gas. It's that oscillation. So this is a story, the basic science of which was understood uh, before the middle of the last century. And then, of course, all the evidence started coming in of the concentrations going up, the temperatures going up. So this was good science ahead of much of the data not all of the data, of course, because Fourier was working with some fairly simple data, but the science is developed ahead of the data, and then the data comes in, and it is fully consistent, confirming the scientific story. This is not a, a, a trend in search of an explanation. It's the other way around. The science, the good science, came first. What are the numbers? Well, we are already 400 parts per million. That's a measure of concentration of CO2, 450 parts per million CO2 equivalent. We're adding about 2.5 parts per million a year. Just after the Second World War, we were adding half a part per million. We are now adding 2.5 parts per million a year, and that's rising still. So 100 years of not doing very much we might add 300 to our 450, 100 times 3, we might add 300 to our 450 to take us to 750, and that would um, essentially take us to 4, 5 degrees, 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5 degrees centigrade. Uh, in 100 years or so, um, above the benchmark, which is the uh, usually the end of the... Um, 19th century before you know, powerful hydrocarbon fueled growth really took off. So that's the usual benchmark for this. We haven't been at three degrees centigrade as a world for around three million years. Remember, we've been around as Homo sapiens for a quarter of a million years, roughly. And our civilizations are post the last, after the last ice age, the Holocene period. And that means that uh, really our civilizations are only eight, nine thousand years old. And that it was a very benign period, plus or minus one degree centigrade uh, over this, in that Holocene period over the last eight or nine thousand years. And that's when we cultivated the grasses. That meant that we settled down and had villages whilst we waited for the crops uh, to grow. We had surpluses so that you could have. Um, people doing other things like you know, universities and book writing and that sort of thing. Um, that's who we are, and it's eight or nine, this last eight or 9,000 years. We're at the edge of that now. And two degrees, we're about 0.8 degrees centigrade above 
second half of the 19th century in average global surface temperature. And we're on the edge of that. Two degrees would be well outside that experience. We're moving into that now. And uh, the scientists have suggested, recommended that above two degrees should be classified as dangerous in large measure, not only because of the accentuation of effects we see now, but also because um, you run the risk of tipping points and irreversibilities. Um, examples would be the thawing of the polar ice. Now, it, the warming of the oceans is inexorable once the surface temperature, but it takes a really long time. But if the polar ice things slide, slide if, the, if the land ice slides off, then you get uh, sea level increases much more quickly. Um, that's Archimedes' principle, right? Um, the uh, intensity of hurricanes and storms, extreme weather events, is governed by the temperature of the water, that, the, the, the oceans. That's where the hurricanes get their energy from. Um, and of course, it's climate change. So some places will be underwater and battered by storms. Other places, including where we are now, would probably start to look like the Sahara Desert. Um, we don't know exactly, but what we can say is the risks are intense. Now, there are some strange people who say, well, if you don't know exactly what's going to happen, you might as well assume nothing will happen, which is a very bad idea. I mean, we know that smoking increases the probability of lung cancer and heart disease, but we don't know that any one individual will indeed. You know, Deng Xiaoping and uh, Winston Churchill smoked heavily way into their old age, and they both went into their 90s. This is about risk analysis. Yeah? And the risks which we face, and I've described, are immense. You'd be pretty uh, reckless to say, well, it might be all right, so relax. And it might be really awful, and indeed it probably will be. And it just wouldn't make any sense to take those kinds of risks. So this is the story. The risks we're playing for are intense. If we are lax in our attempts to manage climate change, the probabilities of very unpleasant events, existential events for many hundreds of millions of people, uh, those, those are high. So you'd be really mad to, to go there. So this is a story then, as I've told it, of immense risks, lots of uncertainty, long lags, and where the cause of the problem is the sum total of what we all do, not just what one person does. So immense scale, right outside our experience, uncertainty, long lags, and there's this publicness of the effect, it's the sum total of what we all, that makes it as about as difficult for economic policy. Now, we're very bad at thinking outside our experience. We don't deal with uncertainty very well. We're pretty useless at dealing with uh, long lags. And uh, if it's the sum total of what we do rather than what I do, I mean, I don't see immediately the consequences of my actions from uh, emitting greenhouse gases. It's just, and it's the science's fault. I've tried chastising my scientific friends, but they're describing the science. They're not responsible. This is basic science, but it, that's the way it's fallen out for us. But nevertheless, that's what we have to handle, and we can see how to do it. So that's enough on the basic um, uh, story and why it makes it so difficult for um, public policy. Let me now turn to public policy itself. And, uh, there are many people in this room who do public policy. That's what I did and do. Uh, and uh, this is an absolutely fascinating public policy. It's intellectually fascinating as well as vitally important. Now, uncertainty, sometimes when there's uncertainty, it makes sense to wait and see. Well, I can't see what's going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'll look closely and I'll see how things play out. In this context, it'd be a terrible mistake. And I've already said why, because this is a flow stock problem. The flow of constant, the flow of emissions builds up into the stock. And it's very difficult to reduce the stock. So it's uh, certainly very difficult to, use the, to reduce the stock in any kind of uh, short time period. So that's the problem. 
And um, it means there's a ratchet effect, if you like. The later you leave it, the more difficult the starting point. But there's a second one, which I've already referred to, which is the lock-in of infrastructure and capital. What we build, whether it's a city or a power station or if uh, whatever we destroy, if it's the forests or the soil, those things have very long-lasting effects. So there are two reasons um, uh, why delay is dangerous. But let me, having said that, talk about what kind of policies are at issue here. And this is the one bit that'll be um, slightly technical. I hope it's actually all a bit obvious, but there's lots of economics in this slide. Um, I know it might not be all that obvious that there's lots of economics in the side because I've tried to express it in a way that's commonsensical. But you could spend a lifetime analysing just one of these things. Clearly, um, there's a problem of market failure. These are all problems of market failure. There's a problem of market failure associated with the emissions of greenhouse gases. When you emit greenhouse gases and you don't pay for it, you are damaging the prospects of somebody else. That's a classic uh, externality, market failure in the language of economics. In the Stern Review, I, I called it the greatest market failure the world has ever seen because we're all involved in doing it and uh, we all face the consequences and those consequences might be severe. Now, research and development is at the heart of all this story and ideas are public goods. If I have a great idea, then other people can follow and share that idea. So I do not capture the full returns to my ideas. So that's another potential market failure. And we design various mechanisms in the world, and in regulation, intellectual property rights, and so on, to try and deal with this. But in this case, it's particularly severe because of the scale, because we're in a hurry for the reasons uh, I described, and the use of the idea is not only to create returns for the individual that uses the idea, but the use of the idea benefits lots of people because it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I, since 2008, you don't have to argue very strongly that many of our capital markets don't, don't work very well. Extraordinarily, 15 years ago, you might have got into trouble for, for, just, for suggesting that capital markets don't work very well and people won Nobel Prizes for building models of uh, finance based on fully rational expectations and so on. I, um, anyway, I'm not going to dwell on that, but there are lots of ways, and I'll, I'll touch on some of them later on, um, that you, we can make uh, long-term capital markets work better. Many of the things we're talking about here, and this is the fourth reason that markets alone uh, with unaided uh, would not get to where we need to be, is the, a lot of these things about networks, grids, public uh, transport, recycling and reusing, um, uh, community-based heat and power, all sorts of things that could be a big help depend on networks. So in other words, if you're in a network, what you do affects what other people can do. The structures for that network uh, are things which uh, are usually shared and that again is something that involves some kind of government regulation or intervention if it's to work well. Lots of things here around information all the way from labelling to what's uh, possible and extremely importantly uh, stopping burning greenhouse gases cuts right back on air pollution which is killing millions a year and I'll come back to that story. So six big market failures here so any serious study of the economics of policy should look, just, should look at all of those. This is not just about a price for carbon. Remember I put that first, that's the top of the list, but they're all big, all these six are big in relation. So lots of economics of policy uh, to do here. And the way I've expressed it, it's market-based. It's something that uh, we need to, uh, I've, I've expressed it in a way that suggests strongly we ought to be looking at uh, the market uh, story. So um, let me now turn to um, the uh, scale of the response. I've spoken about the risks, I've spoken about the economics of policy. Well, okay, I've said the kinds of things we have to do, but what about the scale 
of what we have to do. Well, it's very big. The problem is very big, and the scale of the response will have to be um, very big. Um, one measure of the scale of response, and I'll be coming back to the Paris pledges at the end of what I have to say, but the current pledges for Paris look as if we will be 55 or a bit more billion tonnes CO2 equivalent per annum, that's the flow of emissions, in 2030, if you look at the intentions that the different countries of the world have articulated. Um, we are now about 50, so it looks as if we'll go up 10% or more. Actually, for two degree, a two-degree path starting now, looks more like 20% below. So Paris is uh, way too high. If you then say, well, here we are, a strong two-degree path from now would look like a 20% reduction by 2030. Actually, it's going to go up. So how strong would our reaction have to be to keep to two degrees, recognising roughly where we're likely to be in 2030? Well, the answer is on this slide. We need to be at zero total emissions by the end of this century. Zero. So some places are going to be positive, other other activities are going to have to be negative. That's a measure of the size of the challenge. This is not a policy statement from me. This is saying, given where we see ourselves going in the next 15 years, if you just look at the sum total of the emissions, if you look at what the science says about concentrations, this is what you would have to do to have a reasonable chance of holding to two degrees. I usually take reasonable at 50-50, but it's actually, you'd want it to be rather better than that. But uh, uh, you know, there's no certainty here. So, if you're going to be zero total emissions by the end of the century, you're probably going to have to be zero on electricity by mid-century, because that's going to power a lot of the uh, other things. Um, another way of putting the scale is that emissions per unit of output by mid-century, taking into account some assumptions about economic growth, would have to be uh, a factor of seven or eight below where they are now. So we'd have to divide emissions per unit of output by mid-century by a factor of seven or eight. Another way of looking at it is that you can burn uncaptured um, only around a half or so. You can play with the numbers, but half or so of the, ne of the known hydrocarbon reserves. I mean, it makes you why wonder why people are looking for any more because um, if you can only burn a half of what you've got and hold to two degrees then you would hope that the anything that's discovered now would not be used. Um, I guess there are many people betting against the world holding to uh, two degrees. So um, I've given these various different interpretations of the scale of what we have to do but it's clearly a very big change. Now at that point um, it, and one more illustration of that is in this diagram. The blue area is something that looks like two degrees. You can do a bit more now and a bit less later, a bit less now and a bit more later. That's why there's a corridor. But where there's a corridor, you can't stay along the top. You got, if you're at the top in one place, you've got to be at the bottom somewhere else. That's the nature of this uh, corridor. And I've already mentioned that over the next 15 years, we're likely to go up. So the arrow suggests that uh, we might be heading into pretty dangerous territory. Uh, the red area, if we stayed that way, could well be a four, four and a half degree story. And I've said just how dangerous that would be. So I'm emphasizing very strongly here that the risk is great, the urgency is great, and the scale of the change is great. Now, you might be getting really worried now but it's at this point that my story turns much more optim optimistic. Um, if you look, um, if you look, uh, sorry, I've gone too far. If you look back at grave, at the big waves of technological change, starting with uh, the first industrial revolution um, at the uh, end of the 18th century, um, which was the mechanization of textiles through to steam and railways, middle of the 19th, 
steel, electricity, end of the 19th, oil and automobiles, mass production, the first half of the last uh, or more of the last century through to information technology and so on now, you see that in the world's economic history, these are waves of um, innovation, investment and growth. Big waves of technological change are normally periods of growth. Well, that's the first optimistic part of the story. If we move on this strongly, this should be very exciting in terms of discovery, innovation, investment and growth. We can already see a lot of it. And we've got three waves of technological change going on at the same time. Maybe more, but let me just stick with three. You've got the digital and the information. Who knows? We're probably very near the beginnings of that, although it seems like we've been in it for a while. Um, materials, the, uh, all the way from very new things like graphene to uh, changes in what you can do in uh, insulation and batteries and so on. That's moving fast. And so too is biotechnology. So this is an extraordinarily fast uh, period of change uh, in terms of technology and that makes me uh, optimistic too. So that's a second reason for being optimistic. Not only do these kind of periods in economic history uh, give us innovation and investment and growth, also we can see very rapid change on technology now and it could be much more and should be much more rapid. But there's another reason to uh, be optimistic about the attractions of that path and that is how awful the hydrocarbon path really is. So in other words, we'd be moving away from some, not only moving towards attractive things, we'd be moving away from bad things. Hydrocarbons, uh, the burning of hydrocarbons, kills people on a massive scale now through uh, air pollution and risks killing people on a massive scale in the future from climate change. But let's stick with the now for the moment. Um, the, uh, the last five years or so has seen real change in the observation via satellites of where pollution really is. It's not just in Chinese cities. If it's PM 2.5, the much lighter particles that spread across the east coast of China. People talk about PM 10 when they talk about diesel and so on because, well, those are the bigger particles. It's the smallest ones that are the most dangerous. They're the ones that go through your nostrils and your tonsils and coat your lungs. Uh, it's bad in the UK, but it's not nearly as bad as in the UK as it is in China, and China's not nearly as bad as it is in India. India is much worse than China. We should thank our friends in China now for studying this so closely. And they're not just relying on satellite information anymore, they're looking very closely at local measurements on the ground. And some scientists at Berkeley Earth, um, about two months ago now, took some of that very intense local measurement in China, and they worked out that it's killing 4,000 a day in China on air pollution, and uh, it's equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day. Uh, you know, woman, man, and child. And uh, the children, the damage done to children is, it seems, largely irreversible. So this is um, an, an extraordinarily heavy cost now, probably over three million a year worldwide, I think that may be an underestimate, from outdoor air pollution and probably a bit more than that from indoor air pollution. So another reason to celebrate the alternative path is it avoids this kind of killing from air pollution. The Supreme Court in the UK accepted an estimate of around 30,000, this was about four months ago now, accepted an estimate of about 30,000 people being killed a, a day, killed a year in the UK from air pollution. Now, you know, we all think of the London smog of the 1950s where you really couldn't see and I had to walk home uh, from school because they took the buses off the road because you couldn't see more than two or three metres. Well, we got rid of that. Actually, it's a lesson. We got rid of that quite quickly by switching to smokeless fuel. But still, it's the pollution that you can't see that's so problematic. It's the smaller stuff that's the more dangerous. Uh, about 30,000 people killed a year in the UK from air pollution, about 1,700 from road accidents. So about 15 times more, one five times more 
from air pollution in a country that prides itself of being not too bad, and it probably isn't too bad relatively on these kinds of issues. So that is a very big part, and this is something that's changed. The understanding of just how severe this is is quite new, and it's very important and it's starting to change the politics of this story. And it's certainly changed the politics of this story in China, and we should thank the Chinese for taking it so seriously and looking and researching at just uh, what the uh, consequences are. I've mentioned the uh, way in which technical progress is moving. One manifestation of that is solar. The cost of a solar... I started work on the Stern Review 10 years ago, and uh, the cost of a solar panel, solar PV panel, photovoltaic, has come down by a factor of 10 in those 10 years. It is quite remarkable. And of course, a lot of the smart grids, the, the use of information technology has changed very much. Uh, when we wrote the Stern Review, we would never have believed that um, most of the big manufacturers would be making hybrid cars, many of them making electric cars. It's quite extraordinary. You know, Tesla's capital value is more than General Motors. I mean, it is an amazing story of technological change. But that's another reason for cheerfulness. Uh, two days ago, Toyota announced that they expect to be making hardly any conventional combustion engine cars by 2050. There'll be hybrids, fuel cells, electric, and, uh, and so on. It's changing, and changing faster than many of us anticipated. 10 years ago. So these are all reasons to be cheerful about what we could do if we really put our minds to it. Big difference between what we can do and what we will do, but you better establish, before asking people to do something, you better establish first that you can do, and we know we'll learn like mad along the way. So we have enough to set off in a good direction. I'll say just a little bit about the um, infrastructure investment that um, might be necessary. Um, I've told the story of transformation in the world's cities and the world's energy systems and investments in the protection of our forests and uh, regrading, rec reclaiming much of, um, of um, uh, degraded land. All this involves major investment, a very big part of it, infrastructure investment. Just to give a feel for scale, we invest about $3 trillion a year as a world in infrastructure now, and that will probably rise, given the transformations I've indicated, to $5 trillion or more. I mean, think of world GDP as about $80 trillion, so uh, you compare that with $3 trillion a year in uh, infrastructure and the need to increase it. So we have to think hard about how to increase that infrastructure investment. And we have to think quickly about how to do it. It will involve a lot of policy because infrastructure investment is long lived and you have to try to keep down uncertainty as much as you can. Predictability in this area is very important. You can't have certainty, life's not like that, but you can have less uncertainty and government induced risk is the biggest deterrent to investment, in my view, worldwide, particularly in uh, infrastructure. The second is we need to bring down the cost of capital. I mean, long-term borrowing for uh, governments now is at zero, real, or negative, real. That's where we are, and it's where we've been for a while, and it's where we'll probably be for some time longer. When you've got the growth story of the future in front of your eyes, you've got technical progress moving very fast, you've got interest rates on the floor, you've got unemployment in many parts of the world, that has to be the time to take infrastructure investment seriously. Christine Lagarde, bless her, has made a lot of that as managing director of the IMF. That's a story that we have to tell and have to tell very strongly. But to do that, we've got to control the cost of capital. We've got to bring it. The cost of capital to people and firms is much higher than the cost of capital to governments because people who lend to, those who lend to people and firms worry about getting their money back because the world has got lots of uncertainty. At the scale of the government, that's much less worrying. So we need... Chicago can borrow at about 1% real. 
Sao Paulo is about 8% real. It's a huge deterrent to investment, and it's more than just a deterrent to aggregate investment. It's a deterrent to investment um, in capital-intensive activities, and renewables are capital-intensive. It, it's, it's the capital that's the thing, because once you've got your solar stuff, it, sunshine comes for free, similarly for wind. So it's not simply a distortion in holding back the scale of investment, the cost of capital, it's also a distortion in the type of investment that's encouraged. So I could say more, to, I'm very happy on questions to say more about that. I think the role of development banks is going to be very important in that. Maybe I would say that, wouldn't I, having spent 10 years as chief economist of development banks. But nevertheless, I think uh, that's one of the routes. It's not the only route, um, it's part of the story. So I've tried to talk about the policies, the scale of what we're trying to encourage, how exciting it would be, uh, why there's reason to believe that we can do it and the kind of changes that we're seeing, and what's important, what's at the heart of this, which will be the infrastructure story. Now, um, in my book, I've got quite a lot on ethics and politics and psychology. I know I'm an economist, and that's what I do. Um, and that's what I continue to do. But you can't help going there on this subject. Why? Well, the first is on the ethics. This is about how this generation treats the next. That's an ethical question. It's about how this generation shares out activity amongst itself. Now, that's an ethical question. It's about how we change our ways. That's politics and psychology. We did move from leaded to unleaded petrol. We have, on the whole, much stronger control of smoking than we used to do. We treat drunken driving um, much more seriously than we used to. These are all big changes that come about. Sometimes it comes very quickly. If you think of about how the world's changed on gay marriage. It happened very fast. And a lot of the kinds of changes, the ways of doing things, understanding of things, a lot, some of that evidence, some of those examples are there. We need to learn from, from those. How do these kinds of things happen? And the economists have not really engaged very much in this, but this is about how to create behavioral, policy, institutional change. And we economists really ought to be interested in that sort of thing. And there's a fair amount out there. Actually, the political scientists and the psychologists are rather better at it than we are. But nevertheless, there's lots of collaboration and lots of things that we can do. So I got quite deeply, uh, I had long discussions with Danny Kahneman on the behavioral aspects of uh, psychology and wrote that wonderful book, Thinking Fast and thinking slow. I sat down with my old friend um, John Broom, who was a professor of moral philosophy at Oxford, and started, started reading or rereading books I should have read long ago. But let me just, I'm not going to, I haven't, really haven't got time to go into it in great depth, but there's chapter five in the book on the ethics, the last chapter on the sort of more on the politics and the uh, psychology. But let me just say something for a moment um, on the uh, ethics. And let me talk briefly about discounting. Now, we discount in economics for usually for the reason that if you think of people in the future and you assume that they will be better off than us, that's an assumption we should test, you would say, as a matter of ethics, but you would say that uh, if somebody down the track is going to be twice as well off as we are now, then an extra unit of output or consumption to that person will give a lower value to, because that person will be richer. Now, it's an ethical position, but it's one which many people take. And there's nothing wrong with that. Actually, it's one I would take. Um, but of course, you have to think about whether people in the future will be better off than we are now. And in climate change, that's what, in the jargon, we call endogenous. 
in climate change, whether people in the future are better off than now, depends on what we do now. So you can't read off your discounting from somewhere else. It's uh, dependent on what you do, though it's endogenous in that sense. It's part of your choice. You can't say, well, this is going to be imported, this discounting from outside, and I'll plug it into my choice. It's not as simple as that. The second reason, and economists are very bad at this in my view, that uh, you discount, is because you attach, you should not, and I'm about to argue that you should not, but this is what often happens, you attach lower weight to a life simply because it's a future life. So imagine somebody whose life, there are lots of people in this room whose life started at least 35 years after mine. In fact, there are lots of people in this room whose life started more than 45 years after mine. If you take two people, one later, whose life started later, one whose life started earlier, but you assume, for the sake of this piece of moral philosophical inquiry, you assume that they're absolutely identical. Everything about those two individuals is identical. It's their consumption, their background, anything contextual that's relevant. These two people are identical, except for when they were born. Then pure time discounting attaches a lower weight to a later life. It is discrimination by date of birth. That is something which, if you go and look at the various philosophical, moral philosophical systems we try to understand, be it social contractarian, as in sort of Rousseau or Rawls, or if it's uh, sort of Kantian in terms of imagining how other people would behave, or if it's in Aristotle, you know, and you think about virtue ethics and what's virtuous, or if you stick with the kind of framework we have in economics, which usually thinks of anon anonymity or symmetry, you know, that if you, two identical people, you swap them around in your decision, then um, you wouldn't want that to make a difference to how you weight them. So whichever moral philosophical position you come at, you find great difficulty in justifying what I've just described, discrimination by date of birth, discounting of lives, discounting of consumption, because people might be better off, is a different question. This is discounting of lives. I've described this in a way which I hope you wouldn't possibly accept it. But that's a moral position. But because it's a moral position, it, things are, are, are about morality, about ethics, should be things that we can discuss. It doesn't mean that I can tell you what to do or you can tell me what to do, but we ought to be able to discuss them in a consistent, rational, uh, thoughtful way. So I've just given you the reasons why I think that pure time discounting is such a bad idea. I wouldn't have spent the energy doing this if so many people didn't actually do it. And you know, a 2% pure time discount rate, you go and look in the economics literature, you'll often find things. A 2% pure time discount rate means that a life that starts 35 years later has half the value of a life that starts 35 years earlier. And that's unconscionable, in my view. Um, but as I said, that's an ethical position, but uh, I find it very disturbing how often economists wander off in that direction without asking serious questions. So, let me have just one slide on politics and then I'll turn to um, just a very few minutes on Paris. Um, how do we change politics? Um, well, it's not for me to manipulate the world. What I'm trying to do is to try to observe how politics does change, can change. It seems the politics of local communities um, can work very powerfully. Often you find cities capable of taking strong positions because they feel a closer sense of uh, identity. And more and more businesses are taking leadership, um, not only because they think it's the right thing to do, but they actually also think it's business smart to act responsibly. More and more businesses are using an internal price for carbon. Some of it quite high. Uh, Unilever and uh, Walmart and Marks and Spencers in the more sort of retail consumer uh, neck of the woods. Actually a number of oil companies have started to use um, an internal um, 
price of carbon. Uh, I, I mentioned Toyota and where they're going and where they think their outputs are going. Wherever you look, you see this quite strongly. More and more it's coming into the financial sector uh, too. Um, in the financial sector, the pressure on um, uh, investment funds to behave in different ways is mounting. At universities, we see big campaigns for divestment. So those pressures are starting to build. If those of you who want to look into divestment, I strongly recommend you Google AP4. It's a Swedish pension fund, a very big one. And they talk about decarbon decarbonizing the portfolio. There's a splendid guy called Mats Andersson at the uh, head of that. But what they do is that they, because they're big, they'll have a few retail firms in their portfolio, they'll have a few car firms in their portfolio, they'll have a few airlines in their portfolio. What they do is look across industry by industry, uh, they ask them questions, they do their own research, and those which they think are behaving the worst from the point of view of greenhouse gas emissions, they sell and they say publicly why. That's smart because that puts pressure directly on the worst performing firms. If I write a letter to BP uh, saying, dear chief executive of BP, I've noticed that you're an oil company. I don't like that and I'm not going to hold your shares. But what's BP supposed to do? Well, I mean, they don't, you know, they'll just carry on because if on the other hand, if you look across the airline sector and you sell airline shares because they're, you, you know, the ones that behaving most difficult, or you write a letter to some oil company saying you're funding climate science deniers, I mean I wouldn't want to uh, name one of those, but ExxonMobil for example, it's, you, in, in those circumstances you are putting pressure through your investments. So when my students at LSE say are you in favour of divestment, I say yes I am, but this is what I understand by smart, this is the London School of Economics, you're supposed to be understanding incentive structures here. Think of it this way. So I, I, there are lots of things I can do. I mean, it, it, where we are now in Italy, you will have seen particularly the enormous impact of the, um, of the uh, Pope's encyclical Laudato Si. Remarkable effect that uh, that is having. And interestingly, when I first started talking to Danny Kahneman, you know, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for Psychology, really, and asked him, how do people's minds change? How does it happen? And he said, well, he's a great pessimist, so he didn't think it would happen. But he said, um, one of the ways it can happen is religious leadership. And, you know, you're starting to see that. And that, again, is a remarkable uh, 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 Power, power, remarkably powerful force. And of course, as the Pope showed, language is enormously important. He spoke about the globalization of indifference. You know, three words, but very powerful. He put, he, he said, you know, God always forgives. People sometimes forgive and nature never forgives. Again, an extraordinarily powerful way of expression. Language really matters in, in these things. You can logic chop. You know, I wouldn't actually agree with all of the bits of that. That doesn't matter. It's the, it's the way in which an idea is captured and put across. I mean, as long as the idea is basically sound, that's what matters most of all. So uh, we should be discussing ethics. We should be discussing the psychology. We should be discussing the politics, even if we happen to be economics. Let, economists. Let me conclude with just a couple of minutes on, on Paris, and I'm happy to pick that up more in answers to um, questions. Well, the first thing I want to say is why Paris is not Copenhagen. And let me start, and how many, were anybody here at Copenhagen and six years ago? Well, it was really cold, it was chaotic, and it was quarrelsome. And um, it, even so, it got a little way. It wasn't a total disaster because some of the things in there uh, were carried forward the next year to Cancun in an agreement. But nevertheless, it was very difficult. One of the reasons it was very difficult was that there was much less shared understanding than now. And I think we're increasingly understanding together that you can have better growth and better climate. That's moved in the last six years. I, I edited a, oh, sorry, I co-chaired 
the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate with Felipe Calderon. We, we published a, a report called Better Growth, Better Climate uh, one year ago. That's just one example, but that story is deepening. A particular importance within that deepening of understanding is that China and the US both want an agreement. And the biggest change really in the last few years has been in China. Quite remarkable the way in which they've uh, moved and moved strongly. Coal peaked in China last year. And this is a story of action. Now, they're turning around a very big economy. It takes time, but it's beginning. Um, so that's the second reason. Uh, is not only is the understanding deepened, but actually the, the biggest countries are now moving in the same direction as opposed to being suspicious of each other and being uh, tense. The preparation led by Peru, um, we had a very, there was a very good COP20, Paris is COP21, but uh, nearly a year ago COP20 in Peru uh, went well, so we've got a lot of the uh, text. So, there's good reason to believe that it is uh, going to result in an agreement. But, it's a big but, the sum total of intentions I've already said for 2030 are too high, considerably too high for two degrees, which means there has to be a lot of acceleration. So for me, the test of Paris is how fast that acceleration should be. First, that the gap between what's been indicated in terms of total emissions for 2030. That, the gap between that and what's necessary for two degrees has to be recognised. I think it probably will be. But then the consequences of that gap in terms of future direction, how rapidly we have to cut back, should be recognised. And methods for ramping up the um, ambition should be part of the understanding, formal or not, around uh, Paris. So the final thing I want to point to is what's involved in building the mutual confidence that will allow the commitment to ramp up ambition. Mutual understanding of what other people are doing is part of that story. So reviewing and sharing information and learning from experience. Investing strongly in and uh, sharing technology. Bill Gates, uh, after a long period of wondering whether this was important or not, has decided very strongly it is. And uh, he's investing a billion from his own foundation. Now, that's a small amount of money in the grand order of things, but it's an example of the way in which people are getting together around uh, uh, innovation and technology. Elon Musk of uh, Tesla, um, is not going to patent any of his batteries. He's going to make the technology widely available. So that's moving again. Direction's good, pace nowhere near strong enough, but that will be part of the Paris story, and so too will finance. The international institutions, I think, now must become much more involved, uh, including the multilateral development banks and the G20. I mentioned the G20 because I've emphasized throughout this talk that this is a story about economic development, economic growth, overcoming poverty. UNFCCC is largely an environmental organization. You've got to have the big economics gatherings uh, involved in this. Not only environment ministers, but also finance ministers, economy ministers, prime ministers, and uh, presidents. So you can see that I'm very optimistic about what we can do and why it could be so attractive. I worry, as probably all of us here do, whether we will do it. But for me, a precondition for arguing that we should do something is showing what it's like, what's involved, and how attractive it could be. So I, I firmly believe that we can rise to the two defining challenges of our century, overcoming poverty and managing climate change. Thank you very much. Professor Stern, as director of the Florence School of Regulation Climate, it is a great pleasure and honor to host you and to discuss your presentation today. Anyone with a minimum knowledge 
and interest in climate change issues knows the huge impact of the Stern Review on the economics of climate change when published almost exactly nine years ago. At the time, and back home, I remember friends or family whom I had never heard talking about climate change before, lively discussing matters raised in your review. This was clearly related to the impressive me media attention to the review, which also put the issue on top of political agendas in many countries for the first time. The impact on the academic world was not, was not let, less impressive, and there was an immediate positive externality for those like me working in the area. The central role of economics in climate change discussion was vindicated at a moment when many people still wondered what economists could do or could contribute in this area, and your work also fostered an intense and rich academic debate among economists researching in climate change impacts and policies. There is, therefore, a before and after the Stern Review. Almost 10 years have passed, and here you are, presenting a new book with an inspiring short title, Why Are We Waiting?, which probably summarizes most of the two decade long inquiries of climate change economists. Damages, design of corrective policies, international agreements, and the generalized constraints to policies and international coordination. The book, as you indicate in several locations, although clearly connected, is not a mere, a mere update of the review, due basically to two reasons. Many things have changed since, 2000, since 2006 in the world and in our academic understanding of the climate change problem and its solutions. And in the book, you are particularly keen to stress the socioeconomic opportunities and challenges to align climate protection with a means, a structural change that we will face in the next few decades. Two other things particularly attracted my attention when reading the, when reading the book your emphasis in the need for a deep interdisciplinary approach, not just on the customary nexus, science, technology, economics, with explicit incorporation of philosophy and psychology, which I am sure that is, it is welcomed by many of my EUI social science colleagues present here. And also your continuous references to overcoming poverty as part of the climate solution, which is in line with the growing sociopolitical and academic interest and concerns on global inequality. From my previous comments, it should be now clear that discussing this book is not an easy task. You need to have an encyclopedic knowledge not only of the economics of climate change, which is already a huge and growing, growing field, but also of the science, technology, and other social sciences operating in the area. I'm sure that the audience, including a diverse, a diverse set of academics from the EUI and elsewhere, and also a, a big group of uh, external people so interested in this issue as to come here on, on a Friday afternoon, will provide valuable insights on many of these matters in, in the subsequent questions. So let me be a bit egotistic and, and focus on a non-minor part of the book that actually constitutes the, the guiding topic of our research unit, the design and economic assessment of climate policies. As a prominent public economist by education, I'm sure that you will be comfortable with this and able to provide us with some valuable insights and ideas for our work. Actually, one of your most quoted sentences, which you mentioned before, refers to climate change as the result of the greatest market failure that the world ha has seen, hence the need for corrective policies. FSR Climate was born in, 20, in 2010 thanks to a fortunate confluence of interests of the EUI and the European Commission so that a rigorous and real policy-oriented knowledge could be developed on the application of European climate policies. During the first three years, with funding of DG Climate, most of our activities focused on the analysis of the EU ETS and specific renewable promotion policies. Indeed, last June, we celebrated here the 10th anniversary of the EU ETS, with the presence of the main figures, policymakers, academics, and regulated sectors that actually made the system possible. After 2014, with the sole support of uh, Robert Schumann Center, 
we embarked in a wider working agenda that incorporates European energy and environmental taxation and energy efficiency policies, probably expanding soon to mitigation in agriculture, and that considers explicitly member state actions and distributional analysis. Our intention is to become a hub of research and discussion in these matters, given our EU status, working coordinately with other institutions in Europe and elsewhere, and to be able to contribute to future climate policies by showing what is working and what has not worked in the EU. So my first explicit question, quite important for our mission, would be on your views after your huge exposure to policymakers and the stakeholders from all over the world in the last few years on the actual influence of European climate policies. Can they, they be replicated in other countries, particularly in the emerging developing world? Can they be taken as a prototype for future global action? Related to that, it is very common to hear that the EU has the most comprehensive set of climate policies in operation, so that direct or indirect ambitious climate targets are attained. I'm not sure whether you share this rather triumphalist uh, view, but I would like to know your opinion on some related issues that are being debated in current EU climate policies, but also have global relevance. First, the role of targets. Is it sensible to have many targets or a single THG emission target that may lead to the appropriate level of energy efficiency and renewable efforts? Second, how to define the right policy package? Your book is clear on the, and your presentation are clear, were clear on the relevance of carbon pricing, but hints to the necessary combination with renewable promotion tools, standards, and information approaches. I strongly sympathize with this, as there might be positive synergies between policy tools, full coverage of emitters, an issue op operation of the price signal, etc. Yet previous work of our unit has quantified, for example, the very large implicit carbon price associated to the promotion of renewables in several European countries. So there seems to be a significant economic issue in the design of European climate policies. Then there is the question of interacting policy instruments. Again, for example, it is possible that a strong energy efficiency policy reduces electricity demand and depresses the CO2 price, also possible with renewable promotion, and thus increases emissions in other sectors subject to the EU ETS. And finally, we have obvious jurisdictional interactions due to the allocation of different regulatory tools or to the variable interest of national and subnational governments in the issue of climate change. For instance, this is the case with Region Toscana here, quite proactive in climate change matters and quite collaborative with us. Again, an example on this area is the UK carbon price floor, whose operation has obvious effects on internal mitigation, but also outside the UK through the above mentioned EU ETS channels. So far, I've been talking about climate policy reform, but there are probably two questions that deserve stronger attention and belong to the so-called climate policy design. First, to know more on the factors that prevent the introduction of credible, credible climate change policies. How is it possible, for example, that the only tax that has not been raised in Spain during the crisis, the recent crisis, the recent crisis in a highly dependent, energy dependent country with significant transport related GHG emissions and strapped for cash public sector was that on car fuels. By the way, below the EU average. Can this be related perhaps to the perception of citizens on energy goods, on their responsibilities in climate change mitigation? Our research in this topic seems to indicate that clear and comprehensive policy packages may be helpful to promote the introduction of climate policies, but much more evidence is necessary. Second question relates to the capacity of climate policy to send long-term long signals necessary to foster proper operational and investment decisions by GHG emitters. And here we seem to have another problem, 
as seen in the early dismantling of renewable support policies in several countries. Again, unfortunately, Spain being a clear example. Or on the low level of carbon prices when they exist. The book indicates that it is necessary to combine long-term policy stability with flexibility. But this does not seem an easy task. As I said before, the distribution of costs of climate policies are of great interest for FSR climate because they may explain and, and help overcome some of the problems faced by climate policies. In fact, next Thursday, we organize a roundtable on these matters in the city center, in the city center of Florence with the presence of uh, a prominent academic, Martin Weizmann, a former policymaker, former minister of the German government, Klaus Topfer, and a representative of the Catholic Church, a Jesuit. Everybody, by the way, is invited, and we hope to see some of you there. Uh, more information is on our, we in, in our website of the, of, of, of the of F FSR climate. I could say that the distributive debate around climate policies is indeed very rich, including the conventional calculation of who pays the costs with respect to income within a country, which is a hot topic nowadays in many developed countries, given the energy poverty debate. The distribution of mitigation costs between countries. You mentioned this before. And how costs and benefits accrue to different generations. However, when I read the book, and I saw that around two thirds of currently proved fossil fuel reserves needed to be kept unexploited to stay below the two degree increase, the potential problems associated to the management of such a huge distributional effect came immediately to my mind. How to deal with this in the energy transition? Intensifying research efforts on CCS, why are not um, fossil fuel producers, sellers more involved in this, really? It's quite surprising. Letting the carbon price operate, compensating losers. The book also indicates that reducing poverty is key to successful climate protection. And it is evident that large scale GHG mitigation will not be possible if it keeps a large share of the world's population in dire economic conditions. But again, our experiences so far have been rather negative. China's recent economic progress, the process that took most people out of poverty in less time in the history of humankind, has caused tremendous environmental problems, disasters. So related to this, how can we foster a process of growth that provides good quality employment at limited environmental costs? Short-term responses may include retrofitting building stock, especially in the developed world, and medium-term infrastructural changes to mitigate to mitigate and adapt to climate change may provide further answers. But I wonder whether the new carbon-free economy may keep the current intensification of capital with respect to labor and inequalities. Lord Stern, again, thanks so much for coming to the EUI to share your inspiring ideas with us. I hope that I have not been too demanding with our curiosity. It is not common to have you, for us to have you around. And of course, I don't expect uh, precise answers to, to the previous comments. But I do hope that some of the issues I raised are interesting and appealing to you, thus contributing to strengthen our relationship with you and the LSE in the future. And please bear in mind that we already have ties with some of your close collaborators there, Sam Van Hauser, Antoine de Celepet, or Luca Taschini, with some names. And several of them are coming next week, actually, to our annual conference here. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, rather than asking Lo Lord Stern to engage directly now, I'd like to open it to the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd ask you as a courtesy to our guest to say who you are. So, Jean-Michel, and then, yes. Could you comment more about the two recent... Uh... Jean-Michel. Yeah, Jean-Michel, from school. 
Could you comment more about two recent news? One is the governor of the Bank of England giving advice to the insurance industry. And the other one is several big companies, I, I take only the French, Total Energy, saying that they use uh, internal carbon price now to, to, to understand how they, they have to invest. And what do you think about it? And what do you think they bring to the policy you would like to get? Hello, I'm Peter Segetti. I'm a Max Weber Fellow here. My question is about consumption in the first world. Um, you have talked about finance and uh, politics. Uh, will we, as over-consumers, have to do something? What, what can you say about that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Gunther Wilms. I work in my different life for the European Commission but I speak strictly privately here as a EU fellow. I wanted to take up a point that you mentioned about politics. The positive examples that you mentioned were the Pope, China, and some pension funds. All these representatives of organizations that are not strictly democratic. You mentioned as well the G20 in Elmau, where they uh, took as, as an objective not to have any carbon burned for electricity by the end of the century. If you look at the same time at the plants in the biggest member state of the Union, you see that there are many carbon, pro, carbon burning electricity plants planned. So I, when I heard this, I thought uh, a little bit about uh, Pygmalion and Professor Higgins' approach to, to the gentility, that the most important aspect is a perfect and impeccable speech. Thank you. Uh, Francesco Francioni from the Law Department. Uh, you mentioned, and this was the strongest message of your lecture, that uh, growth and uh, uh, climate policy go hand in hand. My question is, uh, where do we stand today after so many years after the uh, Rio Declaration, when uh, sustainable development was uh, framed, at least in legal terms and political terms, as a development in harmony with nature. Now, you mentioned uh, the Pope's uh, 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 letter, and of course that is exactly what he meant. But today, of course, we look at uh, sustainable development in a totally different manner, and I think that is also your message. That is uh, conquering nature uh, through new technology, new science, biotechnology, etc. So are we going, my question is, to ditch entirely this idea of sustainable development? Uh, this is a cultural problem. How, in other words, are we uh, placing ourselves uh, in terms of the human conditions in the relation with nature. That is not a science problem, it's more a cultural problem. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Reis, um, British Institute of Florence. In your, first of all, thank you for your extraordinary presentation. Um, in your book, you have a chapter on international equity and some very striking um, statistics on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, would you be able to say a bit more about international equity and especially uh, the role and expectations of uh, developing countries? Um, my name is Stefano Verde. I work as researcher in Xavier uh, Labandera's La Bandera's uh, unit. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for your work. Um, and I say this as a citizen and a researcher in this field. Um, I read the book and there was one passage that uh, caught my uh, attention and which goes, we are more than narrowly, narrowly interested, fully informed, in instantly calculating, relentlessly maximizing individuals with totally clear objectives assumed by first year undergraduate economic theory. I agree with this statement, but I would like to, to hear more what are the implications for economic analysis and the economist profession. I think on that note, <laughs> we will give you an opportunity to address all of these areas. 
Thank, thank you very much for those very thoughtful and difficult questions. Let, let me try. Um, and uh, Chabier, thanks so much for thinking uh, so deeply and hard about these questions um, as reflected here, but also all the work that you do. Um, and I'm personally delighted at the ties with LSC. Um, well done for inviting Marty Weitzman. He's been a good friend for 40 years or so. He does great work. So you're, you're asking the right people for your um, gathering that's coming. Um, now, the role of targets, um, I think that they do matter because what's at stake here is clarity in the sense of direction. And I did emphasize when I was talking about infrastructure, but it's not just infrastructure, the importance of people making long-term investments, including discovering technologies, um, having some idea of where the, world, where the world economy is going. And uh, in the UK, we have variable government policy, we have had, um, but we've got cross-party support for the overall targets, including cutting by 80% our emissions 1990 to 2050, and each five years we bring out a rolling five-year target, and so the second half of the next decade will be the subject of the next carbon budget, which will be coming out next year sometime. So I think um, the sense of direction, if all the parties keep saying, as they do in the UK, I mean, forgive me for using that as an example, um, if all the parties stay with those targets, then you've got some feel for the sense of direction. Now, ideally, you'd want stability of policies as well, but I think the overall targets are helpful. Within those um, overall targets, not too many sub-targets, it seems to me, but I think some, and I think a renewable one has some sense because um, they're such an important part of the story. And if you look back at European experience, it was the emphasis on solar and wind in Europe, particularly Germany and Spain, but also other places, that brought the cost down so remarkably. It was a combination of those policies and China's amazing ability to go to scale. And it was fantastic. It was amazingly successful. I mean, imagine that the cost of a solar panel comes down by a factor of 10 in 10 years. Those are very successful policies in my book. And I think it came from both things. It came from the sense of direction and it came from the particularly renewable targets as, many, as manifested in many places through a feed-in tariff. So I think whilst, those problems, whilst there were some problems, they're mostly problems of success and they're better problems to have than uh, problems of failure. So I do think that uh, the overall target is vital, um, but that some other targets, for example, renewables, but not, not too many. So the first part of my answer is about clarity of sense of direction. The second is about integration. One of the problems, I think, in, in Europe is that we had these different targets, we didn't think hard enough about how they were integrated. And you point to energy efficiency, and the, the further you go, the more you bring down the carbon price, unless, of course, you revise your carbon markets to take into account your success on efficiency. So that's my example about, that's my reply to your question about predictability and flexibility. You need to be predictably flexible. What, what does that mean? Well, you be, need to say, as the cost of renewables come down, we will be reducing the subsidy for renewables. And this is the kind of way we're going to do it. That's predictably flexible. You're not predicting exactly when that happens because you don't know how fast the cost of renewables are coming down. But you're making your criteria for revision clear. And what's been so damaging in many countries, including my own to some extent, is the way in which the policy revision has been unpredictable. So 
we need to be predictably flexible. We have to say how we're going to change and what the uh, criteria for change would be. We were really at fault in the European Union with not cutting back on the uh, emissions of permits or the giving of permits or the selling of permits, not cutting back on that when our economy slowed right down. It's an obvious thing to do. It's not just energy efficiency, it's slow down. Well, you should be cutting back on the permits. And you should have said, or we should have said, we in Europe should have said in advance, this is the pattern of permits. If, if um, actually the economies grow faster, we might, might perhaps um, give a bit more. But if the economies grow slower, we're certainly going to give a bit less. So it's the integration of the different policies and the predictability of the policies, as I said, being predictably flexible, which I do not think is a contradiction uh, in terms. Um, why did Spain put up every tax except the tax on transport? I don't know, but I would say it was a big mistake. And, uh, it's, uh, it may have been associated with the time pattern of oil prices because up to a year and a bit ago, oil prices were pretty high. But the moment politically to put up the taxes on uh, hydrocarbons in transport are exactly when oil prices drop. And we've missed that boat. And we now have, for example, in the UK, uh, negative inflation, not very negative, but a little bit, partly because of the drop in those prices. That was the moment when a government strapped for cash should have been putting up those uh, prices. Well, what can we do in economics is um, keep going. But actually what we're doing in this case is uh, wandering into the area of the political scientist. I mean, what we're saying is the best time to do these things is when prices come down. There's always an argument for having the, the carbon tax or irrespective of what's happening to, we know that as economists, but politically the best time to do it is when uh, the oil price is falling. We miss that boat. Um, carbon capture and storage, I think is starting to come back into the technological discussion. And the reason for it, I think, is that the hydrocarbon companies now have begun to realize that they can't make the climate story go away. The first reaction was to hope it doesn't happen. And maybe if you rubbish the science, you make it less likely to happen. That's gone away now, I think. And for example, the intervention of Mark Carney, as was raised in one of the other questions, the Governor of the Bank of England, he said two things. He said that I'm Governor of the Bank of England, and I do financial stability. That's his job, as well as inflation. He has both jobs. And he said, well, you know, the very big uh, impacts of um, these disasters can be very destabilizing. And in addition, the uh, overvaluation of the oil companies could also lead to financial in instability. So um, I do think that oil companies are beginning to worry about the keep it in the ground uh, movements. And I think they're now realizing that to stay in business over the long term, they really do need carbon capture and storage. And my own view is that this problem is so big and so hard that we need everything. And we need to explore everything, be it nuclear, CCS, renewables, different kinds of renewables, including hydroelectricity and so on. Um, I sincerely hope that the big winner will be solar and wind and tidal. And let's get the innovation behind those things. But we don't know for sure how all these things are going to play out. And uh, we need to pursue them all. So I do think that CCS uh, really does matter. China, you, meant, you raised the short story of China's growth and the environmental damage. What China is beginning to say, and I hope they will make it more and more public, and I'm speaking to very senior Chinese people coming next week to the UK, what's very important now is China says publicly what it has been saying in private for a long time which is that if we knew 20 years ago what we were doing to the congestion in our cities and the pollution in our air, we would have done it differently. So they are not saying our growth path was the right one and now having got a bit better off, we're turning to the environment. They're not saying that. 
They're not saying this thing comes first and that thing comes second. They're saying if we had only understood, we could have moved much faster on the environmental front. That's what they believe, that's what they're arguing, that's the consequences. That's underlying what they're doing now. So I think that is a very important uh, story. Now, um, the, uh, uh, let, let me turn to other questions, but I'm not, I haven't fully answered all your questions, but I'll pick up, I hope, at least some of them in the answers to the other questions. Um, uh, John Michel mentioned uh, the governor of the uh, Bank of England, and I hope I heard you correctly. It was Total that you mentioned as the internal oil price. Well, I've said a little bit about the governor of the bank. Why did he do it? He said, my rubric is financial stability. And he based his analysis on that. And, and I read the speech rather carefully, and it was very carefully attuned to his rubric, which was financial stability. Um, I did, with a friend, go and see him about 18 months ago to start to talk about these issues, and he was very cautious. Um, he worked it out and thought for himself. About a year ago, he started making indications along these lines. And a couple of weeks ago, he gave that very powerful and well-considered and well-researched speech. The governor of the Central Bank of China, Zhou Xiaochuan, takes this enormously ser seriously in China. is going to make green finance a very big issue in the G20 presidency next year. It's very interesting how the senior financial figures now are taking it. Christine Lagarde uh, famously said three years ago in Davos that if we don't tackle this problem, we'll be roasted, toasted, grilled, and fried. I mean, for a French head of the IMF, a suitably culinary uh, concept uh, being introduced into the analysis. But she's been very clear and strong on this, thinking about economic growth and economic stability. So we had many examples of strong moves in good directions. It wasn't just Total. I think there were five European oil companies that wrote to their government saying, please, let's have a serious carbon price. And most of them are already using an internal carbon price, and not a trivial one, 30 or 40 or more dollars a ton of CO2. So all this is an example of things moving in a good direction, which should make us feel that something can happen. But as I've kept saying right through my whole talk, nowhere near fast enough. But it's better to be moving in the right direction than not moving in the right direction. On the consumption of the first world and overconsumption, and how far are these sort of ethical and cultural issues uh, wound together? And both Peter and Francesco raised those uh, issues. Um, for me, the key thing is to break the link between the way we do things and the destruction that they cause. So in other words, we have to learn how to produce and consume in ways which do much less damage to the world around us. What matters is awareness of the consequences of our actions. That comes first. Now we talk about technology, we talk about different ways of doing things, but first is the awareness of what we're doing. The awareness of what we're doing in climate change, the awareness of what we're doing in air pollution, that's fundamental. That's an understanding. That's about understanding. But suppose we stop growing right now in the world, but didn't do anything else other than stop growing. We would be emitting 50 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent. That's way too high. I mean, it has to be 20 in uh, 2050 or less. The stopping growing simply doesn't do this. And uh, we have to do something much more fundamental, really, which is to break the link between consumption and production on one hand and the damage we do to the environment on the other. And we have to begin by understanding that before we can uh, break it. But we do understand much about that. I say that as a, as, a, as a matter of the logic. You know, you couldn't do it just by, even get anywhere near doing it, just by stopping growth. But the second reason is the politics. If you say, well, here I am, you know, professor at LSC, and I've worked out that uh, all that growth stuff is passé, we can't do it anymore, we've filled up the atmosphere. So believe me, uh, India, China, Africa, or even, you know, Germany, UK, USA, this has got to stop. You're not going to get anywhere. I mean, it's a political dead end. And uh, so that's the reason I'm not to sort of 
big attacker of what we might call consumerism, what I am in favour of is doing things differently and doing things differently quickly based on an understanding of the consequences of uh, our uh, actions. I'm, I'm running out of time, but international equity, Julia uh, raised. Um, the, um, essentially, we need to be about two tonnes per capita as a world in the middle of the century, 2050. That's because we have to be about 20 tonnes total emissions and we'll be nine and a bit billion people. So 20 billion tonnes total emissions, nine billion people, close to two tonnes per capita. That's about where India is now. Um, Europe is about 10, China eight or nine, United States close to 20. So that's a measure of how much we have to change. I've given reasons to believe we can do this, but you can see immediately that the rich country is going to have to react much faster than the, than the, the poor countries, um, simply on the arithmetic of where we need to be, because there won't be many people below two tons per capita. The average is the average. There can't be many people above. So I do think the rich countries first and foremost have the responsibility of example, but it goes beyond that to uh, finance and technology as, uh, as well. Um, Gunter mentioned that he didn't think uh, Pope, the China and the pension funds were the first stop for democracy. Um, uh, I actually hope that democratic uh, institutions uh, can look ahead. Um, the suggestion is always that democratic um, structures are inherently short term. But it depends on what people demand and what people ask for. So I think the best way is a combination of real leadership. And Xi Jinping and Barack Obama are leading from the top. With, we want the Angela Merkel of 2007. She led from the top, both in the EU and in the uh, G7. Uh, the Pope's leading from the top. Um, at the same time as social movements which demand change, particularly from young, uh, young people. It, it's, it's those things coming together and the bits in the middle too, how the cities and communities function. So I'd like not to be as pessimistic about democracy as you sort of implied in your question, but you probably do have waves of optimism about democracy from time to time as, as well. Very last question about behavioural, at least I'll answer it in terms of behavioural economics. Those of you who've never done economics might be surprised to know that we model for our first year students consumer behaviour in the following way. That consumers know exactly what they want to do in the sense of what kind of utility they'll get from different kinds of goods and they know all about all the goods that are available. Secondly, they understand the prices of all these things and they work out what's the best thing for them in a perfectly calculated way using all the information that's available. Now, I've told that story in a way that makes it sound not very plausible, but that's what we do. Now, we say, well, that's a benchmark. Of course, there are complications. There's lots of information people don't have. They don't calculate uh, all that well, but nevertheless, uh, that's where we'll start. It may not be a bad starting point, but really, I've mean, already mentioned the work of uh, Danny Kahneman. That I think one of the best things that have happened to economics in the last 25 years is behavioral economics. Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. You know, you, you make up your, on a December 31st, you say, I'm not going to eat a donut next year. No donuts. And then, middle of January, a donut comes with a cup of coffee and you, you take it. What you thought on December 31st was thinking slow, what you thought in the middle of January is thinking fast. And we're starting to talk in economics about these different kinds of behaviours and what difference uh, it makes. It makes real problems for policy, because what, who is the real you? Is it the one that took the donut or the one resolved that not to take the donut? Well, the problem is they're both you, but that makes the economics of policy a bit more complicated, but that's part of the fun of our subject, so let me leave it there.
thank you. As I listened to Lord Stern this afternoon, a line from a very obscure 16th century English poet kept running through my head, and that's Robert Herrick. And the line is, I sing of times transshifting. And this afternoon, Lord Stern, you spoke to us of times transshifting. We live in a time that is transshifting, and dealing with those shifts and transitions and change will require all of our ingenuity and our capacity as humankind to address this. We w it will require an enormous mobilization of power, power in the good sense, power to achieve as opposed to power to coerce. Public power, private power, financial power, collective power, but also uh, our power as, uh, as individuals. So it's been, for me, an inspiring afternoon in the lead up to Paris. It is a very important time in the life of, uh, of our planet. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for being here, for sharing with us your wisdom, your knowledge, uh, and your optimism. Because I think psychologically for humankind, it really is important to think that problems can be addressed. If we don't, then the danger is we don't try. So there are possibilities there, and there are solutions there. Uh, I'd also uh, like to thank uh, Julia Race, the director of the uh, British Institute of Florence, for collaborating with us on this. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Xavier Labanderia, my colleague in the uh, FSR Climate Unit and his team. Uh, the Climate Unit is a small but really important part of the Florence School of Regulation uh, and the Schumann Centre. Uh, I'd like to thank the Logistic Services at the EUI, Communications Services at the EUI, and not least Sarah Beck, my assistant, without whom nothing happens. Uh, for for all of the work that went into making this such an important event for us. And when we think about it, Lord Stern's last uh, slide when he said we can overcome poverty and manage climate change, uh, there is possibly no richer vision, no richer vision for, our troubled, uh, for our troubled times than thinking that we can address these very large and big problems uh, and that we can have uh, midway through the century, at least for my grandchildren, a, a better and safer world. So thank you all for being here, for engaging with us, and again, Lord Stern, thank you for your presence.